So give them a round of applause as they come up today. Come on, Henry and Kath. Um, these guys phoned Lorraine and myself during the week and just said, hey, have life groups started yet? I don't know. We just feel in our hearts so strongly that we need to have a life group in our home. And we said, oh my goodness, we think that is amazing. Um, and we just love their heart for people. Um, and God, it's so good that God is just expanding that and growing that um, out of their ministry at Keeney's. They're now running something in their home. And you guys, we just um, want to honor you so much. As I was praying for you this week, the word the Lord dropped into my heart for you is steadfast. You're a steadfast people. And the word steadfast means unswervingly firm, fixed. You know what you believe in. And every time I speak to you, I just sense that about you, that you know, that you know, that you know what you believe. You know who God is. And steadfast also means loyal and faithful. You are loyal and faithful people. And I just want to commend you today for uh, just your obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I know that that guides and directs every part of your life. And often you'll tell me about just conversations you have or people you meet and you're just constantly obedient. You're so faithful and loyal to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we're just so excited that you've opened your home in a new way to just love on people. And church, I want to tell you, these people will be steadfast as leaders. If you're in the city, if you're around the central area, if you think that's a life group I can get to, these leaders will look after you so faithfully and loyally, just as they serve so many of us already. And, and we just want to bless you today. We just want to commend you and release you into this new area that God's put on your heart. Um, and we're just so grateful that you're a part of CLEAR and a part of our church body. We just love having you around. So we love you, Kath and Henry. Um, Let's reach out our hands to them. We also have an urn for you. Everyone who starts a life group gets an urn um, and a packet of Tim Tams. So lots of tea and coffee. Very important. Um, but reach out your hands to them. Reach out your hands to them today. Let's pray for them. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for this couple. We just thank you for what you've already built in their lives, Lord. We thank you for years of um, just testimony after testimony after testimony of your goodness and your faithfulness in their lives as they've sought you so diligently, Lord. And we just thank you that um, they've been so faithful and so obedient to your voice, Holy Spirit. There are countless people in this city and all over Australia who've been touched by their lives already. And I thank you that um, even though that's amazing, I feel that's just the beginning for them, Lord. And today we release them into this new season um, in a slightly different area of ministry. They're already ministering in so many capacities, but we bless them as they open their home. I pray for um, divine favor and peace in every area of their lives as they take this new step over their workplaces and their families and their friendships. I just pray your hand of protection and your peace like they've never felt before, Lord. And I just thank you ahead of time for the testimonies and the exciting stories that are going to come from this life group as they step out in obedience to you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Do you want to pray as well, Bill? No, I'm, I'm good with prayer that you'd prayed it perfectly. I just appreciate you guys so, so much. And uh, we value you. All right? And I know, as, as Jess said, they don't like the spotlight. They just like to get on with it and, and do what God's called them to do. And that's just so amazing. We just love them so much. Bless you guys. Have an amazing service. How beautiful is that? <laughs> and my last announcement. <laughs> I'm going to call up now um, Joey. He's leading our young adults, and he's going to share communion with us this morning. Thanks, Joey. <laughs> hey, good morning, guys. It's my honor and privilege to share communion with you this morning. And uh, communion is a time where we celebrate and accomplish redemption. We give thanks and remember all that the Lord has done for us. And so I just wanted to remind you what the scripture says. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And we had, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. But so just what about is it that we are remembering about his broken body? We remember that his body was broken so that ours could be made whole. It says in Isaiah 53, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. It's interesting to note that that word griefs uh, in the Hebrew is the word koli, which actually means sicknesses and diseases. So he bore our sicknesses and our diseases upon himself at the cross. And that word sorrows is physical pain. So when we come to the Lord's table and we remember his broken body, we discern his body that it was broken so that ours would be made whole, that we are well in our bodies. Um, but what else is it that we remember about his blood? It says um, that in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How many know that we celebrate the new covenant when we come to the Lord's table? That we have a righteousness that we did not earn, deserve, or merit based on our performance, but it is a free gift given to us. So it does, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you have done, you know, you come to, the, to Jesus, he forgives and washes you clean of all your sins. So um, and finally, it just says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So that is the confidence that we have when we come to our Lord and our Savior. Um, so if we take the bread in our hand, I just want to pray. Father, thank you for your body that was broken for our healing. Thank you that from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet, we are healed and made well. That by your stripes, we are healed. That your divine life flows in each one of our bodies. Lord, thank you for all you have done. We receive it in Jesus' name. And Lord, we take the cup of this grape juice that represents your blood, Father. And we thank you that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we are blessed not based on our performance, but based on all that you have done for us, that we are washed clean permanently and eternally, forgiven past, present, and future of all our sins, Father. I thank you that as we partake today, we declare that we are partakers of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation from all evil, danger, harm, tragedy, accidents, disease, virus, and curse preservation and healing in our bodies, wholeness, spirit, soul, and body, and prosperity in every area and all your blessings. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. going to come into a time of worship now. Uh, if you feel comfortable, stand. If you want to sit, that's fine too. <laughs> However you desire. But we're just going to turn our, our attention and, and our hearts to God and um, just bring our thanks to Him, bring our praise to Him for everything He's done, everything He's doing, and everything that He will do that we're believing for.
Jesus. Your goodness, Lord, keeps running after us, Lord. You're the one who leaves the 99, Lord, and runs after those who are lost, Lord. You chase us down and nothing, Lord, will stop you, Lord. Your goodness, Lord, your goodness is chasing after us, Lord. You're a good God. You're a good God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you this morning can say that we have a good God? We have an amazing God, a God that's full of love, God that's full of passion, compassion. Amen. Come, let's give God a praise offering. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Come, let's give our band a hand this morning. So good. Great. Yeah, all these champions, can, all these children can come forward. We're going to release the children's church. I pray for them. Look at all these champions. Praise God. You want to pray? All right. Let's pray for these beautiful children. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, that your goodness runs over them all of their days. Thank you, Lord, that at Kids Church, your presence is felt. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you for, um, for us to learn about faith and the mustard seed and the power of that. Thank you, Lord, for planting seeds into their hearts. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. <laughs> Thank you, Dory. <laughs> Praise God. Wow. So good to be in church this morning. How many of you happy to be in church this morning? Woo God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. God is good. Woo. Praise God. So excited to be here this morning. Um, I believe that God has put something on my heart that I believe the church needs to, needs to know. And the church needs to uh, be abreast of. So it's so exciting. Praise God. Let's just uh, pray before we get into the word. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your presence here this morning, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that your ways are so much higher than ours, Lord. But Father, we can press in and we can lay hold of the promises. We can lay hold of those things, Lord, which you have for us, Lord, that we may grow, that we may be strengthened, that we may be made, Lord, more in your image, Lord, that, we may, that others may see you in us, Lord. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you guide me and lead me this morning. And that everybody will receive it as you intended in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Wow. As I said, it's good to be in church this morning. And uh, how many of you have been to gym or go to gym? Let's see. Here's a couple of people. Go to gym. I don't mean that you have a gym membership. But you actually go to the gym. Oh, there is a difference. <laughs> Believe me, I know. <laughs> now, have you, I mean, have you ever pondered why you go to gym? I know those who don't go to gym have probably pondered that. Why, why do people go to gym? <laughs> but have you ever really wondered, have you ever thought, of, you really sat down and thought, Man, why, why am I going? Why am I actually doing this? You know, there's uh, many, many reasons why, why people go to gym. Now, some people go to get fit. Some people for health reasons. In other words, the doctor has prescribed it or the physician or the, the um, uh, chiropractor or whatever has told them that you need to go to gym. You need to recover. You need to do certain things. Some people go to gym because of the... They want to meet somebody, a girl or a guy. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> as funny as that sounds, people do that. Uh, some people go to look good. You know that? <laughs> yes, I lost it. <laughs> you ever see them in the mirror? <laughs> All sorts of things. So they look good. They look good to themselves. 
Obviously, I don't go to gym. <laughs> but in essence, most people go to gym to grow or to get stronger in some way or form. To get stronger. Now, at my, with the place where you start might be low. The place where you start might be you're pretty strong already. But most people go to get stronger. Now, my brother, who is a year older than me, is a cyclist. Uh, in fact, he's a track cyclist. He does a bit of road riding as well, but he's a track cyclist. He's a sprinter. And he, since the time that he started uh, uh, cycling, he's been going to gym. And as he's a year older than me, he should be pretty much my height and, and pretty much my stature, but he's not. Now, he's been going to gym for a long time. Do you know there was a time in his life it was quite some time ago that he could leg press a thousand kilograms, one ton. That is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Now, obviously, he's not that age anymore, and he's my age, well, he's a year older than me, and he doesn't press that sort of weight. But he still can press 500 kilograms, a half a ton, which is still amazing at his age. And, uh, one would think, one would think that if you had some logic to it, some logic to it, that if I went in and uh, I went to gym, that I could possibly press 500 kilograms. Well, you'll be surprised. Now, it doesn't matter whether I've got the same DNA as my brother, because I have the same mother and the same father. And it doesn't matter the fact that we're around about the same age. How many of us know that getting stronger doesn't come with DNA? It comes with effort. It comes with the amount of work that you put in. So if I expect to be like him and to be able to do what he does, I need to put in the same effort. I need to put in the same amount of work. I need to put in the same amount of time as what he did in order to achieve the same goals. In fact, the reality of it is anything in this world that has any form of status of success, it doesn't come at no cost. It comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. And strength in this world comes at a cost. So this morning, I want to talk about finding your strength. Finding your strength. And that doesn't mean to say finding what part of your ministry you're most strong in. In other words, whether you, what giftings are most important. No, finding your strength to continue this journey with God. Finding your strength irrespective of your opposition on, on the, the struggles that you go through. And I want to talk about that. Everything that we do comes at a cost. But that's the things of this world. That's the ways of this world. But the kingdom of God works very, very different. So let's talk a bit about God. Let's talk a bit about who He is and the way that He functions in the kingdom of God. How many of you know whether we have a powerful God? Come on, how many of you know we've got a powerful God? Listen, if you don't know we've got a powerful God, you need to grasp this. Because the reality of it is that's the shortcoming of the church. This means that God, this means that God is rich in strength in every aspect of His being. There's no area in His life, in His being, in His existence that is weak. Every area. Is strong. And his enemies are like chaff before a, fire, before a flame. God is an all-consuming fire. And if his enemies approach him, he will consume them. And we have a perception. We, we, we judge God and we, we, we measure God by our standards, by who we are and the struggles we experience. 
but that's not the reality of who God is. We have a perception that God is equal to our strongest man or our most intelligent person. But it's so far from the truth. It's so far from the truth. The reality is we have a powerful God. We have an almighty God. And there's such a huge gap between God and us. And we need to grasp that. We, see, we should be seeing the church standing out, standing out, standing above the rest of the world. But we don't see that. In fact, we're actually seeing people weak, the church being weak, the church being anxious, the church being confused, and the church being not on the right track, afraid to talk about God. Afraid to confront its enemies. Confraint, uh, afraid to change. Because we may look a little bit different to the world. But church, we're supposed to look different. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to think different. Now if we go back in, in the Bible, we go back in time, we look, we look at some of the characters of the Bible. We can see amazing people People who had strength. And they, they, their character, they, they, the things that they did define them in who they are and what, what God did through them. And ultimately, these people have demonstrated in the Word of God how strong they really were. And believe me, they didn't go to gym. Yes, some of them might have been strong in terms of Samson. Yes. But he didn't get strong because of who he was. He was strong because of the Holy Spirit within him. Without the Holy Spirit within him, after he had cut his hair, he was weak. They could conquer him. They could cut out his eyes. It was the God that was in him that was the power. And all of these people that we see, God was their strength. We see King David Fight Goliath. Now, obviously, at that stage, he wasn't King David. He was a little boy. And Goliath was probably twice his size. Was a trained military man. <laughs> David defeated him. We have Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. And they overcame the flames of the fiery furnace. We have Elijah, who overcame the 450 prophets of Baal. We have many men and women that demonstrated great strength in the Old Testament. There was also Joshua and Caleb who overcame the wilderness and they entered into the promised land, not like the rest of the Israelites who went into the desert to start off. And I love this. Caleb's story is an amazing story and it tells exactly where his strength came from. You can turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. At the time of writing the scripture, Caleb was 85 years old. How many of you are 85? Show of hands. Yeah, there's not even one person. Yeah, you are in, in the prime of your life. Because even at 85, you're in the prime of your life. According to Caleb. There's hope for all of us. Joshua 14, verse 6, Caleb is spoken of like this. He says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old. When Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to, uh, to spy out the land, and I brought back a word to him as it was in my heart. Listen, there is a clear indication of the strength of Caleb. Caleb didn't bring back a word that was represented by what he saw, by what the situation was. He brought back a word that was established in his heart. 
We go on reading. It says, Then nevertheless my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. See, there's a condition to the strength of your heart. And according to Caleb, it's about following the Lord wholly. So Moses swore on that day as saying, Surely the land where your foot shall be shall trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. I just love that aspect, that, con that concept. Caleb is 85 years old. He's been through the desert. He's now entering into the promised land. And he's taking his inheritance. And his claim to fame is not I'm the big hero. Not I'm the one who came through the desert. I'm not I'm the one who is successful. I'm the one who works out and does my gym. No, he is, well, his claim to fame is my God has kept me alive. My God has been my provider. My God has been the one who has been there for me. And then he goes on and he says this. It's as he said, these 45 years since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. And yet I am as strong. Listen to that church. Caleb says, I am as strong as I was the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, um, so it is now my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. 45 years later, he's now 85 years and his strength is just as strong. Why? Because God hasn't changed. God hasn't got smaller. God hasn't become puny. God hasn't faded away into the distance. No, His strength is the same because His God is the same. And the church, until we can understand that, until we can grasp that, until we can take hold of that church, we are going to fluctuate from one strength to the other. We are going to fail. We're going to fall. We're going to struggle through life until we come to the understanding of who our God is. Caleb was convinced that no matter how big the army is or how many the army is, they no match for God. No match for God. We serve a big God, church. In fact, the word big doesn't even give God justice. We serve a powerful God, an almighty God. And we see a lot of movies about Marvel and about Thor and about all these other characters. They are puny. They are insignificant. Because He's the Creator, and we are the creation. There's no in-between, nothing in-between, church. We serve a powerful God. He is almighty. But the moment the church is weak, the church is weak. It's not the way we should be walking. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, For the Spirit God gave us, how many of you know that we've been given the Spirit of God? We've been given the Spirit of God. If you're not sure about that, you need to read your Word. You need to meditate on the Word of God because it's a reality. God has given us His Spirit. And He says, for the Spirit God has given us does not make us timid. In other words, it doesn't make us frail or weak or insignificant. But what it does do, it gives us power. It gives us power, church. It gives us love and gives us self-discipline. We need to ask ourselves, if we're not walking in power and love and self-discipline, what are we walking in? What are we walking in? Are we walking in the Spirit? Are we walking in the ways of God? No, we actually should be walking in power and love and self-discipline. How come we've got a powerful God, a God that's almighty, and He lives on the inside of us, and yet we can't fulfill or walk in the power 
and the love and the self-discipline that he gives us. The word of God is very clear. It says this, it says the same spirit, not a different spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of us. Lives inside of us, church. So it seems like the church has sort of lost sight of who their God really is. In other words, we don't see God as big as He really is. We see God. We see God. And we believe He's on the inside of us, but we just don't think that He's that big. We just don't think that He's all-powerful. He's almighty. Our perception is smaller. In other words, we're the ones who actually take God and we bring Him down to fit into our boxes. We fashion Him and think that's who God is. That's how God functions. That's how He works. But it's not how God wants us to, to work. Yanni spoke a good message last week on sovereignty. Very good message, and it's worth listening to. And Dave also spoke a very good word. But Yanni spoke on sovereignty, and sovereignty is a, is a huge subject. You can approach it from so many angles. But you know, the more I ponder on God's sovereignty, the more I realize that we are still trying to fit God into our boxes. We're still trying to reduce Him so that we can understand Him so that we can comprehend Him, so that we can work within certain parameters. Listen, He is the creator of the universe. Do you understand what that really means? And we've just had a telescope released into, into the universe, floating amongst the stars, and they've been taking pictures of the universe and galaxies, and they've discovered that the galaxies or the universe is so much bigger than they thought. Surprise! <laughs> Why? Because they don't believe in God. And they certainly don't believe in a big God. But our God is mighty. Our God is mighty. He's the, he is the creator of the universe. So why should we question God? Why should we question Him? Who are we to do that? The reason is we think too much of ourselves. We should be thinking more of who He is. Romans 9 to verse 20 says this, But who are you, human beings, to talk back to God? Shall that which is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay this, uh, some pottery for special purpose and some for common use? What if, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? See, we don't know what God goes through in order to accomplish his purpose and his plan. After all, he is the creator of the universe. We're just a creation and we question why he does this and why he does that as if to say we've got more power, as if we've got more authority, as if we've got more say than we actually have. With God's power and strength, he's able to snuff us out like that. With one word, we can all gone. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Why? Because that's not God's character. That's not his nature. That's not his temperament. He has the power, but he doesn't abuse it. His character and his temperament and his nature loves and cares and considers us. Daniel 4 verse 35 says this, All the peoples of the earth, everybody say all. all. What does all mean? It means everybody means there's no exclusion. We might have a couple of people floating around in space in, the, in their little ships, but they're included. Okay, they're not excluded. 
He means all. And he says this, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does, God does as he pleases. In other words, we can't contend it. He does what he wants to do. How many of you got children? Those parents who have got children, how many of you do what you want to do rather than what your children want to do? Now you can have your children chucking their toys, rolling around, throwing a tantrum. Is that going to change what you want to do? No, you don't change what you want to do because you are the parent. And the same thing with God. God is the creator. So the creation doesn't have the right to tell him what to do. He does as he pleases. And he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and also with the people of the earth. And no one can hold back, uh, hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nobody can do that. Because he's almighty and he's all powerful. There's nobody above him. There's nobody above him. The problem is, that you and I stop talking about how great He is. You and I stop thinking about how massive and how wonderful and how awesome He is. You and I stop thinking and meditating on how big He really is. And when we do that, we reduce Him to our level. We stop thinking of Him as this almighty God, but someone who can do a job but might not be able to do any job. We reduce him. We become self-absorbed. We think about ourselves and how we fit into the picture. We think we have rights. But the reality of it is when it comes to God, he is almighty. He is the creator of the universe. We need to remind ourselves of who he is. God is our standard. If there is ever a standard that we need to understand or need to measure up to, it's His standard. He sets the standard. Everything that God does, everything that God says is fair because He is the standard. Now, it might not be great with us or might not, we might not like what God is doing. That's all right. That's all right. But everything he does is fair. But his character makes room for us. His character considers us. His love, his nature considers us. And therefore he allows us to have a voice. He allows us even to come into his presence. How amazing is that? That this incredible God who made everything you can think or imagine, he allows you to come into his presence. He allows you to have a conversation with him. He allows you to get close to him and experience his awesomeness, his very nature. I listened to Francis Chan talk on this subject a while ago, and he quoted J. Vernon McGee, who said it actually quite nicely. He says, this is God's universe, and God does things His way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. <laughs> so until you get a universe, you can have what you'll say. <laughs> That's the reality of it. That is the reality of it. God is almighty. God is almighty. See, we have the right to think how we choose, but so does God. And the way he chooses and the way he thinks trumps all of us. He outweighs us. He's got bigger guns. He's got more muscles. I could say you could get a straw and suck it up. <laughs> no, he is God. Listen, he is sovereign. He is sovereign. In other words, He knows better than us. 
And his plan for you and I is amazing, church. And it's because our thinking is so far offline that we come to struggle. We come to difficulties. We come to anxiety. We come to fear. But if our thinking, church, starts to line up with the way that he thinks, if our thinking starts to line up the way that he says, everything goes to another level. Everything goes to another level. Do you know that in your prayers, how many of you know that, how many of you pray? I'm glad to see the majority of you got your hands up. Because we should all pray. If you're not praying, it means that you don't know the power of God. And you also don't know the power of your prayers. Every one of us should be praying. Because there's power in our prayers. James 5 verse 16 says this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that we can actually accomplish something. When you start confessing your sins and praying for each other, it means you start doing things God's way. And what happens? He says, so that you may be healed. Healed. If you want healing in your life, do it God's way. If you want healing in your life, think God's way. And then he goes on and he says, the prayer of a righteous person. What is a righteous person? A person who is right standing with God. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If you want strength, you need to be righteous. But how many of you know that we're not righteous? We're not righteous. We stumble all the time. We fall short of God's standard. But Christ. But Christ. Listen, Jesus Christ hung on a cross, became sin so that you and I, you and I can become the righteousness of God. See, in other words, what God has done for you and I, He's positioned us so that we can become the righteousness of God, and that we can be positioned so that our prayer can be powerful and effective. So the moment we're thinking like God wants us to think, and we're acting like God wants us to think, we will see the results in our lives. What about walking in the way that God wa wants us to walk? Our lives will go to the next level if we think like God wants us to think. Romans 8.31 says this, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God, the creator of the universe, is for us, who can be against us? If God, who has got the power to snuff us all out, has chosen to be on your side... What can your enemy do? What can your enemy do? Listen, they got a voice. They can choose. They can make a noise. But what can they do? Nothing. Nothing meaningful anyway. The problem why we fear, we struggle and everything is because we believe that God is on our side, but we don't believe He's that big. We don't believe that He's almighty. We don't believe that He's all-powerful. We've lost sight of who He is and how amazing He is. And that's where our strength is, church. That's where our strength is. Our strength is to have a perception, understanding of how big God really is. I want the band to come up, please, if you can. At the end of the day, if they come against you, they're coming against the one who lives in the inside of you. There's an amazing scripture in Isaiah 45. This, this scripture is quoted in, in the New Testament often. Isaiah 45, 22. It goes like this. It says, turn to me and be saved. This is God speaking. This is the creator of the universe speaking. He says, turn to me and be saved. Listen, salvation 
only comes through God. No other way. Your victories in life only come through God. No other way. And if you're not getting the successes and the victories in your life, turn to Him. Turn to Him. He says, turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. Why? For I am God and there is no other. Not Thor. Not Black Widow. Not Superman. No, there is no other. It is God. He is the great I am. There is no other. And listen to what he does. He says, I have sworn. How many of you people have ever sworn? Now, I know you don't swear. I mean, you don't literally swear. But what he's talking about here is how many of you ever made a vow and a commitment before in your life? Now, when we do that, we do that to a higher power, someone greater. You swear to God. Our language is very, very vague because it doesn't pronounce it or doesn't say it very clearly. But we say when we swear to God, it means that I'm prepared to commit to some things and I give an oath to God, to someone who is stronger than me, who has got the, bow, the ability and the power to, to sort me out if I could do it wrong. But what about God? Who's above God? Who does God swear to? Well, listen to what he does. He says, I have sworn by myself. That's how much God is. That's who God is. There is no one above him. There is no one stronger than him. There's no one wiser. No one that is, can even conflict against him. So he swears by himself. In other words, what he's saying to this is that what he's about to say now, nothing's going to change and nothing's ever going to remove it. It's going to come to pass. He says, the word has gone from my mouth in righteousness. And he says that it will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. In other words, they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Church, we've got a perception that this world is strong, that this world can do something, can do something against us. But nothing can be done against us. We have eternal life. We have God who is the creator of the universe living on the inside of us. They might be able to do something to the flesh, but they cannot do something to us as believers because we have eternal life in Christ. But the Word of God is very clear that even those who do not profess Him now will come to a place where they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they will bow their knee. It's not me who's saying that. This is the Creator of the universe that has said that. He's declared it. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen, church. And I want to close with this. Isaiah 15. Isaiah 15 shows us very, very clearly where our strength is. If you want strength, this is where it's at. It starts off and it says, For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, in presence and rest, you will be saved. When you have found yourself in the presence of God and you seek His presence, you will always have salvation because He will encamp about you and He will be with you. But it doesn't stop there. Listen to what it says after that. He says, Then in quietness and trust, is your strength. When you stop having these things go through your mind, causing you confusion, and when the noise is loud, push it down. Because when you quieten yourself before God and place your trust in Him, you'll see you'll regain your strength. You'll become strong in Him and the power of His might. 
That's the desire of God for you. He's an almighty God. And we are merely the creation. But He's paid for the price for you and I to be in His image. And we can find our strength to overcome this world in His presence, in trusting Him, trusting who He is, knowing who He is. Amen. I want everybody to stand. I want everybody just to bow your heads. I believe the presence of God is here this morning. We just heard a scripture says that in the, in the presence of God, we'll find salvation. While everybody's got their heads bowed, not looking around, if you're a Christian, you can be praying. There are people watching online at the moment. And I'm not sure where you find yourself with God. And whether you're struggling life, you're struggling on this journey of life, what your relationship is with God. But one thing I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it's God who is able to deliver us. God is able to set us free. It's God who has paid the price for you and I to have the victory. But the only way that we can have God in our lives for Him to come and live on the inside is if, if we make Him Lord and Savior. If we make a choice, a choice to ask Him to forgive us and then come and live on the inside of us. So this morning I ask if it's you and you want to make your a commitment to God, you want to make a choice to serve God, and to have God come into your life and be Lord, just raise your hand and say, Pastor Bill, please pray for me. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? You have to just raise your hand. You can put your hand down. Is there anybody else? Listen, God is working right now. God is touching people's lives. God is a powerful God. God is not some puny imagination that some person has made up. When you see all these hero movies, these are the people that man have made up. But God is much bigger than that. God is much more powerful than that. And He desires to come and live on the inside of us. And all we have to do is choose Him. So if that's you this morning, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Praise God. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. That person who raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one more step. If you would step out of the aisle and come stand in the front here so we can pray for you. And we as a congregation will all pray for you. Just come forward. Come forward. You've made such a huge decision in your life this morning. It's the best decision you've ever made. Because once, once you invite Christ into your life, your life will change. Your life will transform. And going forward, you will have challenges, but you'll have the God living on the inside of you to overcome. Sorry, what is your name? Roman. Roman, nice to meet you. Well, I tell you, well, God, who is the creator of the universe, today will set you free. Amen. What I want you to do, I want everybody just to say this prayer with me. Roman, if you can just say this prayer with me. Father God, Father God I, thank you I thank you for your Son, for your son Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ, who hung on a cross, hung on a cross to pay for my debt, to pay for my sin, pay for my sin which He did, which he did and, shed and shed His blood for me. I thank you that you have that you have paid the price 
to set me free. I ask now that you would forgive me over my sin and come and live on the inside of me. Be my Lord and be my Savior in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for Roman. Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're upon him right now and that you will anchor this in on his life, that you will renew his mind, Lord, that you would strengthen him in spirit, Lord God, that he would overcome the things of this world. And I thank you, Lord God, that you transform him into the image of Almighty God. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let me be the first one to congratulate you on this joy. Bless you, mate. So good. Praise God. Listen, I want to ask you to go with uh, Kath and Henry. If you can take him into the back and just uh, give him a Bible, walk through the, what he's just done. That's a great choice. Praise God. Let's give God a praise offering this morning. So good. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. So good. Listen, we're going to open up the front here. If you need any prayer, we believe that God is present here to heal, to set free, to provide or meet any need that you have. Amen. We have a God that His hand is not short, but He's able to provide. He's able to heal and set free. So if you need any prayer, please come forward. We'd love to pray for you. We're going to continue to worship. The band's going to continue to worship. But we're going to close the service right now. But also, if you want a fellowship, we're welcome to fellowship outside. There's tea, coffee, something to eat. We'd love to catch up with you, find your, who you are and what you've done and your journey, and uh, certainly get to know you better. So let's just pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that you're transforming our hearts from glory to glory, from strength to strength. And Father, that you put in our hearts a word of, of your power, of your capability, Lord, that we may be mindful of who you are and, and how great you are, Lord, that we may have strength in our bodies, we may have strength in our minds, but we may have strength in this world. Father, we give you all the praise and the glory, and I ask, Father God, as they all go their different ways, that you would camp your angels about them, that you give them peace, you would cause your face to shine upon them and bless them, Lord. I thank you for your angels that bless the, uh, camp about them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Bless you all. Have an amazing week. See you back same time next week. Love you all.